So at that time, I perceived cooking was a woman's thing, not necessary for like now. But then again, when we went aboard a cruise ship in the galley there, uh, it was manned by virtually like all men to some extent. But I'm glad to see women pursuing it. Now, when I used to take students all around the world in culinary competitions, especially like among, like in the Philippines, you find that a lot of the ladies there were like into cake making. The reason be cake decorating, I should say. They had the patience and the fine decoration. They just had that in cake decorating, of course, you know, is great. One thing I can say is that with the cake, you put your icing on, you can cover up a multitude of scenes. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a pleasure being here in Chicago. Uh, it's not the first time being here. We normally come like in May when they have the big culinary uh, exhibition uh, here. Uh, one thing I would say is that um, um, when you're being like into the hospitality industry now, you had you your tongue sort of tasted to some extent, and your eyes full, you see something, but this is just a humble beginning. And keep on learning. Just think of yourself just as good as the next man, and not lesser, okay? You gotta have a positive attitude. You get hurdles that you get you cross, but don't get perturbed about those hurdles. Those hurdles make you stronger. Go on, don't reduce in terms of your concept that it isn't. I wanna be a culinarian, and of course I had to pass this way, I had to go that way, because everybody's probably going a different route. And we were discovered by the Spanish, but colonized by the British. So Bermuda is still a island that uh, comes under the British Commonwealth. The Queen of England, obviously, uh, is still in charge of us, although they, she sends a governor out to Bermuda, and then we select, uh, uh, through politics, we have what they call like the premier. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you can be in charge of your own household. Where you want to go, what route you want to take, and of course, like, you know, the schools help out one another with scholarships and things of their nature. And of course, um, one of the things I know, like where I come from, the island of Bermuda, is a very small island. Doesn't have a lot of people. It's like only about like 70,000 people. One of your ballparks are gonna come they old Bermudians. But we do have a lot of foreigners working there too. We bring in people uh, who are qualified to do maybe certain type of jobs that Bermuda's may not be qualified for, because we don't have universities there. Uh, at the college, and most students graduate, they go to Canada, because Canada used to be a part of the British Commonwealth. So they go there to sort of learn about the business aspect, and also maybe some of us continue to pursue uh, the culinary, but mostly like the, from a management sort of like that. Uh, but like I said, no matter what you get involved into, just do the best of your ability, and all this take of yourself, you're just as good as the next man or better. Now, in this dish today, um, it's a chicken dish. And of course, in the dish goes mushrooms, tomatoes, uh, tomato sauce, and a bit of rosemary, which is like a, a herb, and of course, uh, onion, and of course, uh, the chicken itself. Okay, now, before I start, cook the chicken itself. I will just show you some things. Now, here is like a mirror, and you can um, see, uh, look into the mirror, and see some things, okay? Uh, in this dish, like I said, we have, I have chopped onion. Well, the menu, of course, I, I say, from your onion. Uh, one thing about an onion is that, um, uh, you don't chop it, get there chopping all the, like that there, if you do that, you're bruising it. And then you're gonna get to your eyes are going to sort of like come and take it. But if your eyes are weak, then you gotta be like the diver, put a first scuba diver on your glasses so you, you can actually see. Okay? And of course just just chop it once. It's, it's sort of like imperative. Uh, we also have like um, some garlic to go into this dish. And of course you take Cloves of garlic, all like that. And of course, uh, still got the skin on. So, what you do is take the back of the knife, you just smash that down like that. This helps to facilitate the removal of the outside skin. Okay, see, you just, it just comes off very, very quickly and very, very easy. Uh -huh. 
Dalek, you know, you want to probably find out where he's been to or what the case may be. But Dalek was built out in a lot of conditions. Uh, we have some nice, fresh uh, mushrooms, and of course, we're just going to slice these uh, very, very easy. So I can probably stand there and talk to you and use the knife at the same time, because I'm sort of like used to it, right? But then again, uh, if you cut yourself, that's a part of the trademark in terms of like uh, dealing with the uh, uh, slicing and, and using a knife. I just want to show you something that you don't see hardly any now. Uh, I'm going to take a small knife like this here. Yes, ma'am. You want to adjust it? All right, I'm just going to take this mushroom. It's very seldom you see this type of art nowadays. So take a small knife. What I'm going to do is like almost tog this mushroom. And uh, this is more like like classical sort of like a garnish for a dish. I'm going to make it almost look like a star. You see, you take that and you're I'm putting incisions into the uh, mushroom at this stage. And this will be cooked into some butter and, and slightly sauteed. Okay, see? And you see the uh, indentations like into the mushroom? Yes. And then I can take my knife and just make an indentation in the top here to form like a star. And, uh, but this is like done for like really classical uh, cooking. Okay, see that? I'll probably just pass it around and you got a closer look what it looks like, basically. Okay, so uh, one thing about cooking is that we use a term in the culinary field, maybe you've probably heard of before, what you call mise en place. Okay, mise en place, M-I-S-E-N-P-L-A-C-E. -E. What it means is basic preparation prior to cooking. Okay, uh, I know when you're probably home or you see your mom maybe chop a little bit, put it into the frying pan or the stew, but no, you organize yourself. You get everything together before you start cooking. Whatever goes into the dish, you should organize yourself. It's just like a secretary. A secretary is organized. They have a file, and if the manager says, I'd like to see a certain file or a certain person, they should be able to go there. That's organization. Organization is required in everything that we do. Um, so that, the mom, you know, you know what goes into this dish, fine. This is what I'm gonna do. That's how it's gonna be. Uh, we also have uh, some tomatoes into the particular dish. And these are nice Italian uh, tomatoes that just chopped up. Uh, you can also, what you call blanche tomatoes before you use them. What I mean by blanche is put them into hot water and then you put them in cold water and you remove all the skin, okay? Uh, these are nice Italian uh, tomatoes. You have a lot of tomatoes now. I'm not sure about you know about like tomatoes and some fruits, especially like bananas. They gas them now, okay? I don't want to turn you off for food, but what happens is that they pick them in they're almost like green, and then they put them into like a chamber, and they add gas to them, and that's what, like if they had to ship them from the United States to Bermuda, they're like green, but once they put them into the chamber, by the time they arrive, they are actually uh, uh, ripe. So sometimes when you have a tomato in your hand, that's why it feels so firm, or some of the bananas that you get, I feel firm. You can only throw it up against the wall, it doesn't break. Uh, but what you can't beat is something that has been ripened by the natural sunlight. It's a good source of vitamin D. But the only problem is that it doesn't last longer than something that's being gas. Okay, so in this dish, um, the onions, the uh, tomatoes, the uh, mushrooms, and we have the garlic there. And then, of course, we have some nice fresh rosemary uh, 
as a matter of fact, this grows like almost wild in Bermuda. And you find a lot of people would pick it and put it in a pot and boil it down and make like a herb tea. And you know, a lot of the uh, actual uh, ingredients, like herbs, go wild throughout uh, Bermuda and different parts of the world. And you used to find that maybe you're, like your grandparents would pick over that stuff and, and boil it. And that was used as like herb teas. Of course, now you go into a supermarket, you'll probably find a whole shelf of all kinds of teas. It's unbelievable. Uh, but that's the way life really is. Okay? Now, apart from the uh, that, you need to get the main protein item. And of course, that is the chicken. Now, when you go to the supermarket, you probably get chickens maybe all cut up or ready for you. Uh, here, I have a raw chicken. And of course, I'm just going to show you how to dissect like a raw chicken. Now, sometimes like if I had like students for the first time and we were doing a thing on like chicken, I would go to the chicken market that still has chickens with the feathers on it and the head on it and everything and show you how it's plucked from the beginning. Just to show you, it's humble beginnings because you get so used to going to the supermarket, you get the chicken legs, the chicken breasts, the chicken thighs, but this is a wholesome way of doing things. Uh, just to show, just to tell you a little humor, uh, my wife's sister went to Iran to work, her and her husband, and uh, he was doing some work for the American government, and she went out there to, as a teacher. So. As they got sort of like occupied, they decided to get a maid to clean the house for them. And then after a week or so, they asked the maid, can she cook? She said, yes, me can cook. Anyway, she said, okay, fine, I'd like for you to cook supper for us. Well, when they came out that night, that night uh, for the supper, and they asked the maid, bring the food. Well, they took the top off the pot. And you know, it's surprising that different cultures do different things. Well, uh, here in the pot, they had the chicken. The chicken still had his neck on it, and the chicken still had the feet on it and everything. They said, no more cooking after tonight. No more cooking. Because, you, you know, in the rest of the world, you don't see things like that there. You know what I mean? But you'd be surprised at different cultures. Just like in Bermuda now, for the last, four, like, about four years, if you go to the supermarket, you can actually buy chicken feet. Because you feed from, like, the Filipinos and Jamaicans and stuff like that. They buy just ch chicken feet and boil them down and mm -hmm. suck off the bones and eat them, but just like that. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna move this to the side. <laughs> now, you want to what you call, use the term called fabricating uh, the chicken, okay? Now this is like, for instance, you use roasting of chicken. Uh, it's best to roast it like that third. You take a piece of string and tie the legs. You don't want your legs so wide open like that, looking kind of vulgar, right? <laughs> but you take the legs and secure a piece of string. And then, of course, you would have what we call a trussing needle. I don't know whether you, ever, you guys ever seen a trussing needle. It's a big needle like that. You put a piece of string through it, and you kind of like sew up the um, um, bird itself. I can remember once I had a terrible accident uh, on a bicycle, and someone knocked me on. And I had to go to the hospital, and I had my pelvic bone that was kind of broken. And then they didn't allow kids to come in. But down at the recovery room, I had my son came down. He said, Dad, I said to him, I said, listen, they had put these stitches on his side there like that. He said, stitches? He said, yeah, oh, you mean like Mama Vince is making a dress? You put you on your machine like that there? I said, not that type of sewing machine. He said, no, I said, no, 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 no. You're not doing that type of for that type of action, but you have to explain to them. Okay, so let's look at it from this angle now. We have the chicken, and now in this section here, okay, I take off that wing, and I also dissect this wing. Now, just to show you something, basically, uh, I took some students to the Caribbean in Puerto Rico 
this is like about five years ago, to compete in a culinary competition. And one of the dishes that we did was using chicken wings. You know, the interesting thing now, that you want a snack, how chicken wings is most popular things when you go to a hotel and you call it down, you got your buffalo wings and stuff like that. But they comes more like expensive, but a lot of them do like chicken beans where they can sort of bite off and um, chew off them and enjoy it. Now, we made a dish, what we call uh, chicken lollipops. That was the <laughs> term we call it, chicken lollipops. So here I have this bean, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sort of like just scrape the uh, meat down to like one end, okay? And then, of course, once I scrape it all down to one end, and you'll see what I mean. Now, in order to keep them into shapes, what we did, we first did a trial, then we had it like that. But then I suggested that we had a very small, what you call, like, a cupcake pans. You know, you get, when you do your cupcakes, but you can get little tiny pans with the indentation that size. So you put them, you grease them, and you put them inside there, what it did makes them all uniform together. Because when you're into a judging competition, chefs are looking for like the presentation of dishes and making sure that everything is running like the, the proper way. Okay, so then you just put all that down to the side. We remove the small bone. Okay, we're going to take the small bone out completely and um, and leave the big bone there. So that's why you end up with like what you call like your lollipop. But this will be, the bone will be all cleaned up first, scrape all that stuff off like that. And you have something like that there. And that's what we, they, they, we call it like the lollipop hockey. And you know, something like that, you don't have to go to a competition to do. But if you're having a cocktail party, there's hot orders and things like that. That is something that you can always utilize. And, um, um, you know, get and get by basically. Now, after you got the beans off, and they okay, and we hold the chicken like this here, and we're going to cut down through here, like the, the joint, and then you got a bowl and socket joint there, and you can just like break that basically, but um, and you cut that leg right off. So that's the drumstick and the thigh, okay. So just fold that again and um, um, break that hole and socket joint just like that. Okay, now just move some of this stuff to the side behind me. Uh, one of the things is that when people like to entertain they feel that they always have to get the most expensive piece of meat uh, to present to the guests. But what's wrong with the chicken leg? Okay, now I just want to show you something is that you don't have to sort of like roast the chicken off like this here, but uh, if you ever tried like deboning a chicken leg, okay, and after you de de take the bone out, okay, the center bone out, uh, you can stuff it, put a nice farce, what we call a farce, which is a stuffing, and, um, uh, and then, you know, roast it off. And then, of course, you can present it to your guests and say, oh, she's been very cheap. She gave me a chicken leg you know, for, for dinner. But then again, when they go to cut into it, they're going to find that there's going to be no bone there. So really, you don't have to go out and buy, like, you know, uh, beef tenderloin and stuff like that there just to um, satisfy your, your, your guests. You can use like sometimes the cheapest thing, but also make it sort of appear very, very, very attractive. Okay, so what I'm doing here, taking out taking out that center burn, uh, being I got the whole chicken here, I just want to show you in terms of like how versatile you can become and using the, using the chicken itself. And then of course, like with the bones that's left over, uh, you can boil it down and make a nice chicken stock. 
because the stock is so imperative in cooking. That's how you make a good sauce uh, from a good stock. And it's just like when you're boiling vegetables, um, sometimes you throw that liquid away, but that can be classified as a nice vegetable stock. And you know what I do uh, when it comes to like a stock, especially like for the household, uh, if you have like in your house, you do have an ice tray. And it's not wrong with taking that liquid and put it into an ice tray, and when, once it sets, you, you have different cubes. So families normally have a small amount of stuff to use. So you can take a one or two cubes to make a sauce, or whatever the case may be. Although this time of year, which is winter months, then you might need a lot of stuff to make yourself a nice pot of soup. And it's nothing wrong with like your mom having a nice pot of soup. Okay, so I'm pushing all of the uh, flesh down to the tip of the uh, chicken. Uh, I used to do several TV programs, and I think uh, the lady must have didn't uh, see me sort of like um, uh, push it all down like this here. So she called, and called me back and said, oh, Mr. Mean, you're not only a chef, but you're like a magician also. <laughs> so what I mean is that here we have the meat down there. It does look derogatory, right? So if I just take the back of that knife, and I'm going to cut that out, and then, here I go, uh, hopefully, should be able to get it back. Oh, so the leg is back again, right? Yeah. Okay. You got back the leg. So what I was saying is that to make it sort of beautiful, now inside here, you could put your stuffing, and of course you would secure it with like some string, and that way, that's how you can have a nice stuffed chicken leg with the bones, okay? You can always keep the bones, and of course the bones make a nice chicken stock. Okay, so you see there's no, that bone, I took the bone out completely. And of course, that's how you, you go about uh, making things like that. Like in sections, so that you find, once you find the joints, then it's easy to sort of like cut through. Okay. Um, Get the other part of the uh, chicken. Now, here you have mostly like the chicken breasts, okay? Uh, but if I was making what you call chicken a la Kiev, that's which is like a Russian dish, you take the breast, the breast, and then you put butter into it, or you can take ham and cheese, which would be golden blue, okay? That's the whole breast. But I'm not going to use the whole breast. So I'm just going to cut down one third, and then still find. The, uh, the joint here, where you just cut that through. Uh, and uh, take this off, remove this to the side. Now, doing service, it's just like serving turkey. When you serve like chicken or even turkey, you don't serve all the white meat, you serve some dark meat, and some white meat. Now the dark meat is like the legs and the thighs. Now that's where you have more fat, what you call more cholesterol. That's why you find that chicken breast is more expensive than buying like a chicken uh, leg. Okay, so I just put that one inside and I just take this right off. Now, when you cook, uh, or fry the chicken. Okay, I'm just gonna cut this right down. Here, like that there. And pull this, pull this off. Okay, so this is like the carcass again. Uh, when I first got into like French cooking, they used to keep the carcass and fry that off. That's when they used to have like silver service. Okay, you hardly see silver service now with the waiter going around and spoon and stuff turning. So you should put this on the bottom of a tray, and then you pile all the edible stuff on top of that. So it's kind of raised to some extent. Uh, but that type of service was, was good, but it was very, very, very expensive. Okay, and then of course, I meant to tell you before you, when you roast the chicken, uh, you normally remove what you call the breastbone. Uh, that's where we call like a good luck. 
You ever got the fish spoon and they try to break it in half and said he gets the biggest part, gets his good luck and so forth? Yeah. Okay. And just snip this in half like that. Okay. Now, I don't know how everybody's. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to send up to KFC to get some more chicken because <laughs> since I've got so many people here, I don't know how I'm going to share this. Anyway, just let me dry uh, my hands here. And of course, what we're going to do is seal the chicken. We have to seal the chicken. And when you fry a chicken or seal it, saute it, um, you don't have to put the uh, all the chicken in at once. Uh, what I'm saying is that you cook the dark meat first, that the legs and the thighs. You cook all that first, okay? The, so the, the chicken breast doesn't take long to cook at all. Chicken breast doesn't take long to cold. Hmm? It doesn't. So the other big one I hit earlier. Wash the chicken. Pardon? Why wouldn't you wash the chicken after cutting it up? Uh, well, I washed it beforehand, uh, before I cut it. I, oh. I, I rinsed it in the inside and outside oh, okay. when I first came here. <laughs> but certainly, uh, some people would do that after they cut it up and still rinse it. Uh, but then again, if you got, unless you Cut it dry before you fry it, and not you'll get a lot of splatter mm -hmm. over the place. Yeah. Okay, so we're just going to try to get this up and running, and then I have a, a pair of tongs there uh, to uh, take the uh, cooked chicken out. So this should get up to like um, about 375 or 400 degrees, so that when we put the chicken in. Uh, it, it would have like a nice color. So, like I said, I'm going to seal the uh, dark meat first, that the chicken legs and the chicken thighs, to get that going. Okay? Um, I would assume, like in the United States, we probably had a similar thing like in Bermuda. When I was coming up, everybody had a chicken cook around the house, using be able to keep chickens. But because of the environment has changed now, or the green environment, you can't have like animals around your house uh, like they used to. Uh, people complain about it or they say the chickens are making so much noise or maybe their don't smells or whatever the case may be. So things have changed to a great extent. Although we still have like places that uh, have chickens that which produce eggs. You know, 
how things get sort of like um, um, created. For instance, like KFC, the Colonel, came into like um, um, frying chicken. Uh, he started, his business started from chickens that were finished laying eggs. Okay? But when a chicken finished laying eggs, it's kind of tough. It has a good flavor, but it's tough. But what he did, basically, uh, was to put them into a pressure cooker to reduce all that fiber. And then once he got to a certain level, he took it out and put it through all his seasonings and started to deep fry it. But of course, the business has grown to such an extent, you can't bake for the chickens to get old anymore. Uh, you got them maybe from produce or something like that there. Uh, but that's, that's how the business started. And you find that through uh, going back to like history and stuff like that, uh, lots of dishes were discovered primarily like by mistake and things that, of that nature. Okay? But uh, certainly um, uh, you find that uh, the garnishes in certain dishes also, for instance, like the chicken now, that was more like a ham, okay? Um, but when you got certain chickens, you still got the head on it, and you see the comb. The comb you, in the days gone by used to be a classical garnish, okay? It looks red because there's a lot of blood into it. But when you think about like some of the garnishes, if you have a, a book, that's called the La Repertoire of uh, Culinary Arts. Then it, it tells you all kinds of stuff. And you might say, well, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to get indulged into that. Uh, but you'd be surprised in what man and self used to eat. Yeah, Let me just, you, yes. You, you, you Pardon? You place it, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm bleeding? Yeah. Oh, I think, come on. Yeah. Some blood of the chicken, I think, that just picked up. And I am on it. I was, it was a Halloween. Mm -hmm. And in the sink, I had red food coloring. And I was cutting up something that I put my hand into the sink. And all the red food coloring came up. I said, oh, Dad, I cut myself. Oh, can we take this to the hospital? Can we take this to the hospital? <laughs> you know, but it, I had tricked them because of, um, it looked from kind of red, basically. But I did take myself lately, though. Uh, so it's part of the trademark, sir. Now, if you got a small band-aid, I may just put it there, get myself going. Okay, now, when you, you're cooking, when you're cooking, uh, like frying something, the wrongest thing is do is put it in the frying pan and bring it back to what you put. You can burn yourself, okay? Uh, you always put something into a frying pan uh, away from yourself, like this. So all you guys sitting in the front seat, you got your mom um, uh, insurance because you might get burnt, right? <laughs> no, no, but th those are the things that happen, basically. Okay. So you just put that in, and of course. Uh, the skin side down, okay? Um, when you are cooking something, obviously, the presentation side always goes down in the hand first. That's how you put them on. Uh, you put them on a plate upside down to get these going. Yeah, just a moment. You have a Okay. Right. like a root out of red chicken, and of course the lake on. And one gets the brown egg, and one gets the white egg. Now, some people like to use brown eggs more than they use the white egg. But in reality, there's no difference in the nutrition value. It's just psychology that some people believe that the yolks in a brown egg are much more sort of brighter. 
Now, if you're using duck eggs, you find that uh, duck eggs are not cooked like on a breakfast menu and eaten because they have a certain amount of bacteria. But you find a lot of people put them into cakes because it takes a longer process uh, to cook. And you find that the um, uh, bacteria would be sort of like uh, rid off. Like in oriental cooking, they use a lot of like chicken yolk into certain soups and things like that. And of course, uh, if you travel around the world, you'd be surprised that um, um, different things you'll come in contact with. I think on most people's agenda, when they're traveling, they like to try the food of their country so that you find out how this goes down, how that goes down, and so forth. Uh, it's just like when it comes to different types of soups. You find that every country has a classical soup. I know like the United States, you're known for your clam chowder, the New England and the Manhattan chowder. In Bermuda, we have a fish chowder uh, that is served with like black rum and sherry peppers. So you do have some condiments. Uh, in Japan, they are famous for a shark fin soup. Use the fins of a shark. But the soup is very expensive. It's like cost you like about $40 for a bowl. And it's just, you know, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> and in China, they have a bird's nest soup. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and of course in England, uh, they use like an oxtail, of oxtail soup. Okay, so she got some more oil in there. So now you put the uh, chicken breast in very gently. And of course, uh, just let this sort saute through. So from a whole chicken, if you cut it up into segments, you would normally get four portions, get eight pieces, so two pieces uh, that are served per person. Uh, and of course, remember, a piece of the white meat and a piece of the, uh, the dark meat. Now, when I'm doing like a, a turkey, especially Christmas time, you see how they took the leg, the chicken leg, and took that bone out? I would do my uh, turkey legs like that also, and then I would remove the bone completely, but I put all my turkey stuffing in there and roll it up. And then, of course, when I bake it off, I've got my stuffing in the center with like the dark meat. Uh, because sometimes people always find that the white meat, especially like the breast, it's maybe like dry out or something like that. So if you remove the legs and just cook the chicken breast on its own, uh, you, find, you avoid that um, uh, concept in terms of like having the uh, breast thawed out. Although some firms do have a little indentation in it, so when it pops up in the air, that means that the, uh, the chicken breast is really, really cooked. Unless also you can have your own thermometer. When you get like a, a two, uh, 60 uh, internal degree of temperature. That means that the uh, uh, heat has reached the center of the bird. Now, here is probably hard to see, but like on this piece of chicken here, there's a little blood that's coming up. What that tells me that the heat has reached the center in terms of like this piece of chicken, and it's probably like time to turn it over, okay? And uh, that's just a denote, like, if you're doing like a steak now, and you want to get it like medium rare, well done, of course, it's, uh, it's no problem. But medium rare or blue. You ever heard of a steak blue? Well, that means it's just been popped in the pan, one side, and turned to the other side. It's almost like raw. Okay, a lot of people, you find a lot of people eat uh, steak like that for all blue, and it's almost like a mom. Like, like it's red. That's real classical sort of like eating. Um, I know out in California, when like the ladies used to go, like the uh, actress used to go to certain places, get maybe the hair done or fingernails done and stuff like that there, they used to serve them like champagne and classical food. Maybe I scargo, okay? That's like your snails. And uh, 
foie gras, which is something you hardly see much now, but it's a, it's very expensive type of stuff, and smoked salmon. And while you're sitting there reading, reading a magazine, uh, they would serve you that, that, that classic sort of um, um, type of food. And of course, when you look at a menu nowadays, it's very rare you would see like foie gras. Foie gras is the uh, liver that comes from like the goose, okay? They fatten the goose up and take the liver and make what you call a pate out of it. And some people might like the scargos, okay? Uh, unless you see the snails crawling around the outside of your house, then you start to assimilate and say, oh, I don't want any of that stuff, uh, things like that there. But they have to go through a process before they've been fed to like the human beings. They have to go through like a uh, sort of process in terms of like getting rid of all the unwanted impurities that are in them. So they feed them like on bread and stuff like that there. Okay, so we've almost um, um, gotten through uh, the preparation of this uh, dish. And uh, of course, we're just going to um, <coughs> take this off right now and of course once I take the frying pan away from the, uh, the stove it goes off. I just want to get rid of like some of this um, um, flour in the dish. Okay and I'll put that back on and now I'm going to sort of like saute uh, some of the ingredients that are going to go into the dish itself. Okay, uh, and the fat, and then with a little sort of like uh, butter. Of course, I use, uh, you can't believe it's water. And uh, so you see how that's started to. Uh, work yourself away there. Okay. Um, well, we're going to um, add saute uh, onion. Okay. And uh, the garlic. Now for this uh, saute in the frying pan, uh, I know sometimes when you might look on TV, see the chefs, they use a lot of metal spoons when they mix the things, but I don't like to use metal against metal because it detects heat. It's always good to use like a, a, an actual spoon, uh, to a wooden spoon to detect, uh, to saute, and a wooden spoon is not going to uh, sort of like get, get hot, okay? Okay, so we got that in, then we need to add some of the uh, rosemary, basically. And we're going to add the uh, tomatoes. Uh, you're going to get some moisture from that. Going to uh, saute. Now, one thing like in the classical cookery, like the French, you find a lot of dishes are named after people like classical people, could be a singer, an opera person, or a performer. And uh, it's like we have a soup made from cauliflower, and, but it's called Dewberry. It's because Madame Dewberry was an opera singer, and she always had her hair into like a big sort of doughnut in the back. And it, it kind of was the shape of like a cauliflower, head of cauliflower. And that's how you get some um, cauliflower soup. Although, uh, that's not the French for, for cauliflower because chou-fleur is the French for like cauliflower. But you do have, you know, different names um, after uh, renowned sort of like uh, people. Um, I know there was a famous lady in Bermuda that was honored by the Queen uh, called Madame Bean. And I did, I think, like three dishes in her honor. Uh, made up these dishes and they were published in the newspaper, but I also did a dinner at a house uh, for her. Okay, uh, the champignons, the mushrooms, put those in. Okay, now, put the mushrooms 
you get different types of mushrooms. These are nice sort of like button mushrooms, white. Um, you can get um, um, small button mushrooms and keep the keep them whole. And uh, there are different ways you can go about it. You find that sometimes chefs may take a shortcut rather than using a lot of fresh uh, mushrooms. Maybe use some that came like out of um, a can. Now, uh, I bought this all the way back, all the way from Bermuda. This is cooking sherry. So uh, I'm going to add some of this just to uh, add to the dish. Okay. <laughs> because in classical cooking, when they have like a lot of civil service, you used to find that the waiter used to cook different dishes at the table of the guests. And especially like um, uh, crepe Suzette, which is a dessert type of dish, very thin pancakes. And uh, that used to come in handy. And of course, a very thin steak called Steak Diane. And it was, it was flame at the table. Okay, now let's see what we're going to happen here. I've got some tomato sauce. Okay. So you go out and shop and get your ragu, take a shortcut. You know, that's our thing. Come up. So this has to um, come up to like uh, a boil. And uh, once it comes to a boil, then the chicken almost goes back uh, into the actual uh, dish itself. Now, some of you may watch TV and see all the chefs on TV. Of course, some of you would like to be like the chef you see on TV. But then again, you don't know how long that individual has been cooking. Uh, you, when you see them there, you know, they could have been cooking for like 20, 30 years. But um, um, you just can't become a, like a chef overnight. The uh, more you practice, it's more to your benefit. And if you get involved into like culinary competitions and stuff like that there, it's great. You get a greater exposure when you're out there in the field seeing how other people do things. And yet, you may not sort of like bend the marrow or whatever the case may be, but you bring back a lot of ideas about how you see other people do things. And that's what strengthens you. That's where you take you to another level. Because you can have all these certificates you want put on the wall, but those certificates only got you on first base. But then you gain the practical ability is what is going to take you to like the next level. And that's what it's all about, like in the culinary field. Okay, so that's starting to sort of come, on, come to the boil. And uh, of course, uh, I get as many pieces as possible uh, into this uh, saute pan. Okay, and uh, see what the one transpires. And now, of course, we'll have to let it um, sort of like um, simmer. Okay. Let that sort of simmer. Actually, it should have been put like in a casserole dish and uh, put into the uh, oven to uh, finish it, it, its cooking. And uh, if you're making like, you know, a large amount, then of course that would be a more practical way of dealing with it. Okay. All right. Anyone interested in sort of like your mom asking any questions, anything? Or are you okay? Just ready to sort of feed your taste buds, right? Trying to get your teeth into your mom a piece of the pie. Do you have a question over here? Yes, madam. What's the name of the dish? Oh, saute chicken Bermudez. I mentioned in the earlier days that Bermudez was the guy who discovered Bermuda, and I sort of created a dish like in that in that honor, Bermudez. Although Bermuda was colonized, was discovered by the Spanish, but colonized by the British. Okay, so we've got that going. Okay, about the salt. How much uh, seasoning did you put in? 
was it very minimal? Pardon? The salt. I, I noticed. The sauce? The salt. S A L T. The salt. Yeah, I didn't put a lot of salt. I noticed. No. Um, I, I, one thing with cooking, I don't like to give it something like the overkill. Because being today, people are like in sort of like not using much salt at all. It's just like, you know, sometimes you go out to dinner, I get amazed to see someone having a cup of coffee or tea and you're taking up like five packets of sugar. You know, it's just unbelievable. Be sort of like the things that we're not supposed to do, how we inundate things to ourselves. It's just, you know, the things you're supposed to stay away from and stuff like that there. It's just like if something calls for like a lot of hot sauce. I just try to make it susceptible to what some everybody's going to enjoy. Now, if you want to give it the overkill, here's the hot sauce on the table. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we're getting that it's simmering, getting that together. Um, fill up the plate. That's a lot of um, garnish. So what I'm going to do here, I'll just make like a flour and just take all this, this here, like this here, and um, wind it back. So you have yourself something like a rose. See? It's just a simple uh, decoration. And uh, how you can come up with different things. Uh, today, basically. Now the chicken is not really um, uh, cooked out yet, but it's on its way. And uh, let's turn that over. And uh, see how things are going. Now, a spoon. With a little water, just to uh, do a taste. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. <laughs> so, well, you guys, you have the official tasters, right? Oh, it's a spin around. <laughs> okay. Um, just let that simmer. Now, I uh, see what I'm going to do here. Okay, actually, I just want to um, do something else here. Just wanted to, being uh, I was looking at the time frame, and uh, just to show show you an alternative also. Uh, in Bermuda, we don't grow mangoes. We uh, get them from the Caribbean or, or Mexico. Uh, lots of mangoes, and mangoes are delicious. You know, especially like during the summer. We get mangoes this time of year because they come from like Mexico. And of course, uh, Mexico's uh, lovely, lovely mangoes. And uh, sometimes the prices vary. Like in Bermuda right now, a mango is like a dollar ninety-five cents. Um, but they do vary in price. And this is what we call like a type of um, um, broccoli mango, which is nice and nice and juicy and delicious. So I'm just going to do an alternative dish at the same time while I'm here, although I didn't mention that, but I just thought I'd probably use some of the chicken. And I chopped up some mango and uh, put that sort of like uh, into the frying pan. I should have had just a small amount of like stock just to get to it, just a small amount of stuff. But instead, uh, I don't have any stuff, so I just get uh, some of this stuff to 
<laughs> and then if I had an open flame, I could tilt the pan and then you see all that catch on fire. Okay, but mm -hmm. obviously uh, that's not going to work right now. <laughs> Place it in cold water. See how it how it looks, and then I can have a, another piece of the uh, biscuit. Nice and clean. What was this? 
Other things. So that's what people. That's what it's all about. Being creative and using things, and especially like in Bermuda, like the things that we grow there, we try to use it in other dishes. Uh, first, like Sunday morning, a, a fabulous dish in Bermuda is salt fish. Okay, what you call bacala. So we and we use the foods that go with it. Like you have an avocado pear, a boiled egg, and a nice fresh banana. So those the, the things you that grows actually there. Right now, we, we, everybody's growing a lot of onions in Bermuda, and the onions will be ready until like April. Now, I'm not too sure about um, um, Chicago, but I know in New York and various restaurants, when I go there sometimes, they still got the Bermuda onion on the menu. Because in the days gone by, Bermuda used to export onions, okay, but you don't do that anymore. But there's a place in Texas that has a seed, and they still call it the Bermuda onion. Um, but certainly, um, um, Bermuda onion is good, it has a lot of moisture into it and so forth. And, uh, but I think you can't beat from the garden to the table. That's the freshest thing you can get. So if you have a garden burned a little sort of like herbs or whatever the case may be, and that's one thing a lot of people use now. They use more herbs for the seasoning than rather adding a lot of salt, okay? But I know my granny, no matter what she was cooking, was always a pinch of sugar a pinch of sugar into this, a pinch of sugar into that, whatever the case may be. So guys, I hope that you had your eyes Did open you today, and what you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. And one day, just think in terms that, hey, you can be just like me if you aim high.